I'm Tommaso Poggio. Um, welcome to the CBMM seminar. Um, it's great to have Chi Wan Zhang today. Um, one of so few advantages of getting older, like uh, I'm doing, is to have great students and uh, to welcome back. <laughs> and so Chi Wan is one of them. Uh, I don't know if um, you know, but uh, there is a paper that he published as a, an effect of a pro summer project at Google in uh, 2016, which was called Understanding Deep Learning Requires Rethinking Generalization, which was a milestone, at least in the theory of neural network, has more than 5,000 citations. And uh, actually, this is a good opportunity because I owe you an apology, official apology. At the time, I teased him quite a bit about that paper because they were claiming essentially that uh, theory, classical machine learning theory, cannot explain what they found. And I was objecting to that. But I must say, say it took me um, six years to have now finally a proof that I was right. But. The point is, the paper was really important. <laughs> uh, it was really important because it showed that, that um, you, you can have interpolation of the training data and at the same time, good generalization. Now, people should have known better because there is a classical linear artifact that is a good example of it, and it's the pseudo inverse. But of course, giving a demonstration on CIFAR with a deep network was a different thing. And it, it really was, a, if every theoretical paper more or less cites that paper. So she won. Now, he has done a lot of other interesting things in the meantime. Um, everything you did with me is kind of forgotten. This was a kind of invariance in speech recognition. but. Uh, uh, it only has hundreds of citations in the, instead of 5,000. But, um, but anyway, the more recent work is, uh, um, is going to speak about, it. I think is quite uh, intuitive, high-level understanding, and not only high-level of, possibly, of how these methods, including transformers, work, and this uh, issue of mem generalization and memorization our learning rules and exceptions. And so, Chihuahua. Thanks, Tommy. Um, uh, thanks for the very nice introduction. <laughs> uh, I'm really happy to be back. And I hope uh, what I'm talking about today you will agree on. And so, <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, quantifying and understanding memorization in neural network. It uh, covers uh, some uh, a number of recent projects that uh, I worked with some uh, many of the uh, collaborators here. Um, yeah, feel free to interrupt me anytime if you uh, have any questions. Um, so without further ado, um, I, I want to, I guess, maybe I don't need to motivate uh, that why uh, we want to study those. So first of the, the central topic we study is large neural network that maybe has the potential capa uh, capacity to memorize. And we all know that those neural networks can do amazing things. And the example uh, showing here, like uh, this is the Meet Journey, which is an uh, online service for artists that you can generate art basically by describing what you want. And this is a, a GitHub Copilot that can basically write code based on your comments. And nowadays, we see a lot, uh, many, many more such amazing services and models coming up. Uh, that can do all kind of amazing things. And at, in the meantime, uh, so we have, we know that those models have huge capacity. They can memorize things. Uh, this is an example with GPT-3. Maybe I should update it to GPT-4 now. Uh, but um, yep. this is a concrete example. I prompted with um, uh, the first sentence of a classical novel. And then it complete in the highlighted text, the entire first uh, several paragraph of this text, and ev it even kind of um, do, do the British spelling uh, that are kind of marked as a spell error by our U.S. Um, 
spell checker. So it basically memorized the, the at least the several paragraphs uh, of this uh, book uh, verbatim. So, but like, so what? Like, why does it um, has like why do we need to study it? We we know it memorized, but does it has any implication at all? So, uh, at least for me, there are two kind of reasons why we want to study this. Uh, the first one is more like a scientific motivation where uh, we want to study it from the perspective of, of understanding uh, generalization behavior and learning behavior of neural networks. Uh, for example, so this is another kind of old chatbot that I interacted with. Uh, I was asking it to do a simple calculation and it gave me the, the correct answer. And then somehow uh, along with the answer, it gave me a website and I, I look up the website and it's actually, there is a website that least, uh, it has a page for every pair of uh, numbers up to, I don't know up to uh, how many, but like it has uh, the correct answer on the page. So I'm not saying that uh, the chat, this chatbot is kind of not doing the right thing or is cheating, but uh, I'm saying like when we see the neural networks being able to like generalize do reasoning and do programming and uh, we might be over interpreting it um, like it would be great if we are have deeper understanding or figuring out like uh, how does the neural network do such things uh, maybe it's via like really um, amazing compositional generalization or maybe it's seeing similar examples in the training data that uh, it basically do some kind of pattern matching so I think uh, one motivation is from understanding generalization. The other motivation is more practical, uh, which uh, like we have issues uh, such as privacy and uh, copyright when those models memorize. And uh, this is an, an example from an earlier paper that shows that, for example, if you have a language model, it, you have some sensitive information in your training data, such as your social security number, the model might memorize such things and then it will generate such, uh, leak such information when under attack. And another issue is also related to art is that um, we have those generative models that can generate amazing art and it's very easy for uh, other people who has interest in art to create it without uh, going through a lot of training artistic training, but on, at the same time, um, those artists who trained for a very long time and they went through a very kind of hard procedure of finding their own style might get their style kind of um, copied very easily by other people who just fine tune a model uh, or even uh, out of the box when the artist artwork was somehow included in the internet crawled training data. So. Uh, yeah, those are more practical issues. Like if we are able to understand uh, the memorization of models in this sense, we might be able to uh, maybe modulate, modify it so that we can have better control over those issues. So yeah, um, the outline of the talk will be mostly four part. I, I will probably have time to cover the first three part. If I speak too quickly, I will uh, go to the, the fourth one, but uh, Mostly, I will start with a definition, a formal definition. What what do I mean by memorization when when I talk about it? And then I will talk about memorization mostly in image classification. This is more related to uh, the understanding and generalization perspective. And then the the last part will I will talk about memorization in language model, which covers two type of memorization. One is really those um, model generating training data. The other is more related again to generalization uh, learning theory related stuff. So um, without further ado, um, I want to basically mention like why do we want to define memorization? Uh, the, the, the main reason is that even though memorization is a like everyday concept that we all know, it can mean a lot of different things even when we constrain it to the context of machine learning and deep learning. For example, uh, we have this classical theory of overfitting, like when you do curve fitting, if you use a polynomial of too higher, too high degree, it will fit to the noise and give you those crazy interpolation results. We, we kind of say it memorized the noise in the training data. Or maybe your model learns outliers or even mislabeled example 
uh, we know that model can fit to random label examples. And we, we also call this behavior memorization when we describe it. Um, and the other scenario is that uh, when you have those generating models that are trained to generate something, those models can also just copy or like approximately copy what it seems in the training data. And we, we also say this is a memorization uh, of those uh, particular training data. And we have other things such as like, you can probably attack a model by attract, uh, extracting training data from maybe the model weights or even the activation or even the gradient for training uh, and so on. So there are many different notion of memorization. Uh, what we want here today is mainly as uh, a notion that it's related to generalization. And so we, we want to use this uh, as an angle or as a perspective to understand or have a better insight into the generalization behavior of machine learning. So um, I want to come back to the classical plot that you see in, in your first machine learning class where you have a uh, model complexity in the horizontal axis and then you have error. Uh, in the uh, vertical axis. And there is a region of kind of overfitting where the training error is very low, but your test error is very high. So uh, we call this kind of gap, generalization gap. When this gap is large, we say this model overfit, or we say it memorized the training data without learning a pattern that is generalizable. So uh, we want to extend this notion to measure memorization, basically. But th this, this is a notion about a model, a model that memorizes. What we really want is uh, we want to, to, to kind of compute or test whether or not an example is memorized. So can we extend this notion to measure example property? Um, so in order to do that, let's go back to the, the formula we usually define for generalization gap. Um, there's nothing complicated here. Uh, basically, if you have a machine, uh, machine learning model FS that's trained on the training set S, you measure the training error, which is just the performance on the training set, minus uh, the test error, which is the performance on the test set. Uh, I guess the, the thing here is that you're basically measuring the performance uh, of FS on the example that it has seen during training, minus the performance that it has not seen during training, which like both of them are IID again. And you, you, you define the gap as the generation gap. Now you can basically do some massage to this uh, formula here. Let's say instead of having a particular model, we want to measure the generation gap of a model. Let's say we have an example Z. And then we, again, we measure the gap. But now the first term is basically we sample some model that is trained on some training set, and the, this example Z is included in that training set. So basically, we, we compute the average performance of model that has seen this example minus the average performance of uh, example that has not seen this example. And this gap we call generalization gap of this example. And basically, what we're doing here is kind of like a leave one out uh, measurement, which Tommy has been doing for many decades. Um, and like, uh, given an example, you train a number of model with this example and other examples. And now, and you train another bunch of example without uh, that example, we, we, we call them in and out models. And basically you compute the difference here. Uh, if the gap is large, we call this example memorized. Um, the intuition is that like, if you have a example that is, um, um, the gap is small, meaning that um, even if you have not seen this example in your training, you are, you're still able to predict it quite well. Um, so that means like there are probably many other examples in the training set that encode similar information and model is able to learn the generalizable pattern. So we, we say this example is learned, like it's generalizing. Uh, instead of memorizing us in the ideal syncretic uh, information in that example. On the other hand, if a model only is only able to make a very good prediction after seeing it in a training set, then it's essentially memorizing uh, the unique information encoded in that example.
So yeah, so this gives us a procedure, uh, leave one out estimation, but uh, this is kind of expensive to do, like especially consider nowadays that the data set we're dealing with are pretty large. So uh, we can do a, something that is slightly more smart, uh, which we call subset estimation. So instead of uh, training a bunch of in and out model for every example that you want to measure, you basically uh, just do some random subset, um, random subsetting of your training set and train models on it. And then for every example you want to measure, you go back and filter those models that has seen versus has not seen this example. So I have a um, figurative illustration of the procedure here. Assume you have a training set of many images. What you do is you just randomly subsample, let's say 70% of your training data and you remove the, the remaining 30% from your, your training set and you, you train a model, use your st standard uh, state-of-the-art training pipeline and you will get model f hat. And now you repeat the same thing many, many times, each time with the independent subset, subset sampling of the training set. Um, with that, you will essentially have two matrices here. So the uh, number of rows here correspond to number of times you repeat the training. And the number of columns here re re correspond to number of training examples in your, in your training set. So uh, the first matrix will be the kind of prediction correctness. So the i's row and j's column will mean uh, the i's run, i's train model I trained, whether or not it predict the j's training example correctly. And the, the mask down below will be the binary mask of whether or not I include the j's example in the i's training of the model. And if I just take uh, the i's column, each of the column, I it will basically give me the, all the information I needed to calculate the generalization gap or the memorization score that we defined earlier. Um, yeah, so um, that's basically the definition and a few, I guess, comparison or two other definitions that people have used in the literature. Uh, the first one is, um, again, feeding to, uh, overfitting to random label. Um, it's kind of similar, but here we are not restricted to random label or um, outliers or mislabeled example. Um, I'll, I'll show in a moment some examples. So what we found is that uh, there is actually a continuous spectrum. Like if you think about um, data you found uh, in real world, it's a continuous spectrum of very canonical example and maybe rare subpopulations and then complexity outlier examples and even mislabeled examples. So it's a continuous spectrum there. Uh, so this notion kind of captures that. And um, it has content, some connection to interpolation, but um, interpolation does not really distinguish between uh, memorizing of common examples and outliers. Um, it not super related, I think, to spurious features and uh, it has connection to membership inference attack, which is uh, people using privacy to measure uh, privacy. And um, it related to training data reconstruction, but like training data reconstruction usually means, um, in, in many cases, you usually generating model, but here we, we mostly talk about uh, classification model, but I will talk about language model in the second part of the talk. So there will be some connection there. Uh, yeah, so, and we have language model. So um, I guess that's the definition uh, we're working with for memorization. And here we're, we'll be going to look at some uh, result um, in the first part in image classification, and then we will talk about language models. Um, so uh, this is exactly what we did with the, the procedure I, I described. And you, we train a number of models, and then we compute the mask, and then we compute uh, memorization score for each ex example. And then we can essentially rank the example according to their scores. Um, or we can maybe threshold it. Like if the memorization gap, generation gap is uh, small, we say it's not memorized. And if it's large, we say it's memorized. What we see here is that the score matches our intuition uh, quite well. Like, for example, this is a peacock class in the ImageNet. 
data set. Uh, the canonical example are essentially not memorized, and those are because it provides more or less similar visual information to help the model discriminate uh, this class. But on the other hand, if you look at the memorized example, um, they're much less canonical, and they're like essentially uh, encoding like rare populations. For example, there's I didn't know there is a sub population of uh, white peacock uh, until I, I saw those images. Um, but and there are also some very ambiguous and outlier example that may or not may not be classified as peacock, uh, depending on the context. So um, I guess that there this is just more examples of it and. This is the class uh, toaster. Again, the canonical examples are not memorized, uh, but the memorized examples contains a lot of outliers and ambiguous uh, examples. Um, so uh, one thing we, we look at uh, when we have the memorization score is that we want to see, I guess, the, the learning dynamics or learning behavior of those examples throughout training. And the, what we're plotting here is basically we group the example uh, into bin, subset of beans, and then um, ranging from low memorization to high memorization, and we want to track how well they learn throughout training. And I guess maybe somewhat unsurprisingly, uh, we found that for di even for different optimizers, the um, memorized example are learned much later um, than the non-memorized example. That might explain why early stopping uh, helps a lot in some cases. And for the same reason, we kind of imagine that you can maybe after you identify and memorize the example, because they, those are not very, uh, like some of them are, uh, are liars, you, you might want to remove those examples. Maybe that helps generalization. And that's a natural thing to try. And that's what we try here on this SVHN data set. And it kind of helps a bit up to some extent. However, if you try it on um, many other like uh, data set, like here we tried ImageNet C400. It actually hurt performance after you remove memorized example. What's um, surprising is that um, removing memorized example hurt even more than removing random example. So if you re remove equal number of example, like randomly sampled from training set, um, the test performance will drop. But if you just remove the top K memorized example, the, the performance drop even more. So that's a kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon, which kind of uh, like connected to this observation or this trend that larger model usually leads to better generalization. And that's what people observe in practice. And larger model usually means you have, you, you, you have more memorization because this model has more capacity to memorize. And, uh, here I'm just citing some figures from uh, the literature. Like we have the scaling law in language model. Basically, the larger your model, uh, the more compute your model can do, uh, the, the better the performance. And here we have the double descent phenomenon, where we also see that after a certain threshold, more larger model basically leads to better uh, generalization. So on one hand, we are thinking that generalization and memorization are kind of the opposite thing. But on the other hand, we are seeing this um, phenomenon that memorization or memorization kind of is kind of essential to generalization. And removing memorized example hurt generalization. So uh, what's going on here? Um, the, and then we, we try to uh, answer this question. And in the end, I think the, at least the intuition is pretty simple uh, in the sense that like if you Imagine, like, even when you are dealing with um, um, standard machine learning benchmark data set that has equally, like, um, partition, like you have, uh, for example, uh, 10,000 examples in each class, they are equally balanced. Um, they are still, there are still, like, uh, subpopulations within each class that has different uh, property or different uh, frequency when you sample them. So. Um, on the one hand, you have those canonical examples that has high frequency, but you also have a long tail, which contains many of those subpopulations that are rare subpopulation or rare instances in your training data. Um, memorization helps because memorizing those 
rare instance or instances or subpopulations in the tail could potentially help uh, the, the test accuracy because in the test set you might also run into similar examples in the tail. So even though for each of the subpopulation, the frequency is very low, but if you consider the entire tail, um, it actually has some non-trivial probability of uh, seeing those examples. And um, uh, there's actually uh, one of uh, our collaborator, Vitaly, has a, a theory paper trying to, they have a, um, a model to describe this behavior. Like, uh, I'm not, like we, we're not going to go into details here, but essentially what it says is that the generalization error of any classifier, any uh, model, will be larger than the optimal generalization error that you can achieve plus some term. And this term can be lower bounded uh, if by the, basically, um, it can be lower bounded if your model does not memorize uh, the, the training example. So um, essentially, so this, this theoretical model is constructed on a kind of a simple discrete learning scenario that can be extended to uh, a mixture of uh, distribution case, but it's still kind of um, uh, synthetic. And the key here is that if this distribution follows a long tail, uh, we can show that uh, achieving the optimal generalization is only possible when you memorize everything. So, um, but like one thing we want to do is to, to verify whether or not this uh, synthetic or theoretical model is true in, in real world uh, data. So in order to do that, we basically um, try to um, s compute uh, the memorization uh, in real world data and try to find, um, basically measure the generalization impact of those memorized examples. So for each memorized example, we try to find if there is a, like if the hypothesis is true, then there is going to be a test example that's also in the tail, but that kind of matches the corresponding training example. And we want to find it. But I guess the question is how to find it. Uh, the answer uh, is we can basically extend the original memorization equation to compute uh, some kind of influence. Uh, so basically here we are measuring the kind of the gap, but the performance gap of on this example itself when we include or exclude it from the training set. But we, what we can do is we can decouple the two and we can measure uh, the impact of include, inclusion or exclusion of this example on a, another example, uh, uh, the performance of another example. And this gave us uh, the influence of a particular example on a, a training example on a particular test example. So uh, here is again an uh, uh, illustration of what we are trying to do. And assume we have some example, uh, some training set, and a subset of it, the purple colored one, are memorized examples. And what we do is we basically try to compute the influence uh, using the formula we described in the previous page. And we will identify um, the example pairs between train and test that has large inference uh, um, exceeding a certain threshold. And then after we identify those, um, we can, excuse me, uh, we can essentially remove the corresponding training example that has, that is memorized and has strong influence on a particular test example. And then we measure uh, how, that, how does it impact the, the test uh, performance. And um, for example, on this CIFAR 100, to the data set, we identify around a thousand unique uh, training example that has strong influence on a test example. How big is the training set in CIFAR? Uh, it's 50,000. 50,000. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, not a very big subset. So most of the example, uh, I guess it also depends on the threshold you're choosing, where we try to make it uh, kind of conservative so that it's not like including other example. Uh, but yeah, so we, we see a test accuracy drop of the same model after we remove this uh, thousand example. And I guess this is also uh, consistent with what we observed before, like because memorized example help generalization. Uh, interesting thing is that this 
performance drop 2%, uh, 2.5% is equivalent to if you just remove random example, you have to remove uh, 11,000 example in order to achieve the same drop. Uh, but I guess what's more in interesting is that um, the test accuracy on the corresponding, um, on those examples that are highly influenced by those examples drop significantly, and it almost, like, this drop almost entirely explained the performance drop in the entire uh, test accuracy. And here we have some uh, kind of illustrative example of images we found. Um, so in the first column we have training images, and in the second column we have test images, and the test images are ranked by the influence of this particular training image on it. So the first test image will have the strong will receive the strongest inference and the remaining image will like with decreasing order. So uh, we, here we sample a different like uh, number of image from different uh, influence ranges from high to intermediate. Uh, what, what you essentially see is that the first image on the right or the most strongest influenced test image um, is very visually uh, similar and sometimes even maybe di just different crops of the same images. Um, and, that it, and also that image is usually not a canonical uh, instance in that class. So um, here we're seeing like a relatively intermediate influence and you see they're still quite visually uh, related. And this particular training example provide very strong support of uh, for correctly cl classifying these uh, training images. And similar things happens on CIFAR data set, and it's even more severe there in the sense that there's a lot of near duplicate image between train sets and test set in the CIFAR data set. Um, I think earlier uh, algorithm that, like when people construct such data set, they do deduplication, but the, the earlier algorithm were not good enough to identify those images. And those ended up being the most strongly uh, coupled pairs. Um, yeah, so I think <laughs> in summary that kind of um, is uh, affirmative of the hypothesis that um, why memorization helps generalization in, in those large models is kind of uh, at least uh, mostly explained by this kind of hypothesis of a long tail. And next I want to talk a bit about memorization in, in language model. Yeah, question. Uh, just to understand this memorization score metric. So it seems that it defines or it captures how canonical the image is. There are other ways of defining this. Have you checked whether these two metrics are like, uh, how related these two metrics are? Yeah, so uh, I think um, that's a good, very good question. So um, relationship of this memorization metric to other memorization metric, I guess I, I talk about uh, uh, it a bit in the table I presented where, um, so there are, for example, there are memorization in the sense that um, you are essentially overfitting to random labels. Uh, th those are people called memorization. And that's kind of, that's, that's actually captured by this. Like if you have random labels, then you are sort of by definition, except with a, a chance of guessing that you will have um, high gap in the memorization score. And there are also like the notion of interpolation, for example, where uh, you basically your model have large enough capacity that it fits all the training example. But that that notion is kind of general like in, in the sense like if you have a canonical example, it also fit to the training data. It does not distinguish between a more canonical example and a more um, outlier example. And we're going to talk in a, a few moments in language model where it's essentially a generating model where uh, one thing that is very natural to, to measure is when you generate something, you, you check whether or not it, it's basically copying from the training data. And this is also a notion of memorization. And there is actually a sort of anti-correlation between this notion of memorization and the memorization score we, we defined earlier. Um, I hope that answers you. Yeah, OK. I've also defined the memorability score for images. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder whether you have checked whether there is a correlation between your score and that memorability. 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, so. One thing, one interesting thing here is that this memorization score we define is purely based on the learning behavior of a model. Like it kind of disregard the content of that image. I think memorability score like defines humans' response to it, and maybe there are some characteristic of image that uh, image content that is more memorable. Um, but here, we define it mostly via the dynamics of model learning. Um, we didn't explicitly measure the content because it's kind of hard to computationally estimate it. But I think in the end, it's not completely irrelevant to what content is. But it's, it's more like uh, measuring the relationship between a, tr a particular training example and the, the rest of the training example, whether or not there are many similar, uh, visually similar or semantically similar examples, uh, or whether or not it's an outlier uh, or a, a rare subpopulations. Yeah. Uh, so if I understood it correctly, the ones with the high, the data points of the, with the high influence are the ones of the mode, not the long tail. Is that correct, first of all? Um, so if you, if your example is not in the long tail, it's kind of not possible to have very strong influence because uh, the influence will be kind of equally distributed among many training examples. So there's no single training example that can incur like a dominant influence on a test example. So if, if you imagine you have a canonical peacock and you have another peacock in a test set, this example cannot influence the test example because if you, even if you remove it, uh, there are many other canonical peacock that provide the same visual information for the model to learn to recognize the test peacock. Only if this one itself is unique it, in, in the tail that it's kind of rare, can it has a dominating influence on the test example. So it's... So I, I guess, could you clarify further on like how you are going about identifying the long tails here? Because here it seems like even uh, the high influence are probably mo most likely or more likely to be the modes or the canonical examples you're talking about. But the low influence ones will actually be the long tail, the rare ones that will be somehow help, like magically be helpful right later on, right? Yes, yes. So uh, what we did is a kind of two-step procedure. Uh, so we first find the memorized example, which by definition are the example in the tail. And then among those examples, we find the, the example that has the strongest influence, dominating influence on a single or a, a few test examples. So it's a, like a two-step procedure. So we don't include other examples that are the mode of a dominating cluster. But also by uh, calculation, those examples like modes of a dominating, a very high frequent subcluster, they will not have a very uh, high influence score under this definition anyway. Yeah. Cool. Uh, another question? You use the word memorization, but is it possible to recover these images? Like whatever you call like as high memorized images, like do you recover them as well? Is there a way to like, recover them verbatim? Yeah, so uh, recovering you mean attacking, like uh, extracting. Yeah, so uh, there is a deep connection between memorization uh, in, under this definition and uh, membership inference attack, which is not exactly extracting the, the example, but it, the membership inference attack is a, a canonical privacy attack where the attacker want to figure out whether or not you include a particular example in your training set. And, um, it is kind of recently known that um, the most memorized example are the most vulnerable to such a, a privacy attack. Um, maybe there are ways you can extend this uh, membership inference attack to reconstructing those uh, images from the model. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if there are uh, existing algorithms to do so. I'll quickly talk about uh, language model, and this is just a basic introduction to language model, but I'm sure everybody here knows what the language model is. And uh, in particular, in language model, I want to talk about some scaling law we measure in the memorization of language model. And I will talk about some uh, 
work we, we, we did on trying to prevent memorization in language model. And uh, in the end, I will uh, basically compare the memorization, verbatim or textual memorization to semantic level memorization that also loop back to what we, we, we talked about uh, earlier in the vision model. So um, I guess the special thing about a language model is that it's a generating model and it actually generate uh, examples. And the natural thing we can do is we can basically compare the generated example with the training set to see whether or not it matches. And if it matches, it's a very natural definition of memorization. Basically, essentially, your model maybe didn't learn how to speak English, but it stores a, uh, uh, a lot of essays in its ways, and it can be repeat the same thing when you, when you do the right prompt. Maybe that's, that's the same. Uh, so we want to measure how, to what extent the model memorized things. And the pr protocol here is very simple. We just sample a, a pr particular prefix from the training set, and then we prompt it with the model and ask it to generate a completion, and then we compare it with the training example to see if it uh, matches. And it, it does not necessarily match the original example where we generate prompt because there are many similar or other uh, examples in the training set that could ha contain similar prefix but has different prompt, uh, different completion, and model can match others. So um, we check all the training examples uh, to see if there is a match. And um, one thing we measure is um, whether or not, or like how does the model's memorization behavior impact it uh, by different uh, parameters. And here we are measuring the model size. We know that larger models generalize better, but uh, we, we want to measure whether or not larger model also memorize more. So here we have essentially a log linear um, curve showing the, the positive correlation with the model size and the memorization behavior. Uh, one interesting thing we were asking is when we see more match with the training data, is it because the model that actually memorized thing more training data, or is it actually becoming better at English, let's say, and it knows how to write the correct or a, a more meaningful sentence in the end that it happens to match the training data more. So in order to uh, um, test that hypothesis, we have a baseline model, which is trained on a different training set, but also with um, increasing model sizes. And it turns out that for the baseline uh, model that's not trained on the particular training set, the um, memorization rate does not increase, increase significantly with the model size. So I think it, it's fair to say that this it actually measures memorization instead of the language capability. Um, the other thing. Uh, that's kind of interesting in this definition of memorization is that it's measure, it measures uh, the operational wise how much data you can extract, but it's not necessary. It's kind of a lower bound of what the model memorizes. Maybe the model stores more information in, in the, the ways that you are not able to extract in this mechanism. So here what we're measuring is we increase the length of the prompt we gave it to model so that um, we see whether or not Giving more context allows the model to recover, recover the, the uh, memorized, memorized text more like with higher chance. So it turns out to be true. So what we are measuring essentially uh, is only what we are we call it discoverability, what we are extra able to extract. But if you give it more context, you can extract more. And uh, the the last um, kind of scaling law here we discover is that. Um, it turns out there is a lot of uh, repetitions or near repetitions in the training set that are crawled from internet. And it turns out that the repetition of data has a very large impact uh, in terms of the memorization rate. And basically the more repetition you have, the more uh, likely the, the text is going to be memorized. So uh, with those kind of measurement in hind, we are uh, now trying to see if we can modify or prevent the language model from memorizing. Uh, the, I guess the most approachable, actionable thing is uh, with the repetition of data because we, we don't want to restrict the model size. Apparently larger models are going to be way better than those smaller models and people won't be able to trade that off. And prompt lens is not something that we can control. Like if an adversary comes and they 
are able to do whatever they want. So um, repetition in the training data is the most actionable. So what we did here is that um, um, we essentially implement an efficient algorithm to detect near duplicate uh, examples in a common language model training set. Uh, what we found is that there are a lot of duplicate in many common data set, uh, including like near duplicate between training example and also between train and test examples. And they're not very clean. Uh, yeah, maybe 3% is not that large in terms of this number, but those data sets are also quite large. Like 3% of C4 data set is 10 million documents. So um, I think another fun example we found is that there is one kind of advertisement, I think, that's repeated 60,000 times in this single data set. So the, the model are seeing very skewered uh, distribution of data, text data um, we're training ways. And those, here are some examples of near duplicate we found um, in uh, those data set. And some of them are just templated text with different filling in, and some are kind of this is like news article and the other one citing it and verbatim copying a large paragraph and, and so on. And uh, what we found is that if you can do detect those near duplicate and then deduplicate your training data to remove those duplicate, it actually has almost no impact or slightly better improve, a slight improvement on your model utility perplexity, but it will uh, drastically reduce the memorization uh, rate of those models. And another way to uh, prevent memorization is that um, you can maybe during inference time do some check. Like I check the, the 10 gram that I'm going to generate, whether or not it matches any training document. If it does, I reject it and then ask them all to do another one. Uh, this is a very simple solution that actually turns out to be very uh, effective with a quotation mark. Uh, so here, uh, recall, we have a very nice uh, data structure called Bloom filter that can actually very efficiently do this. And it gives us zero false negative rate, meaning that it, it is kind of conservative, but it will never miss a memorization check. So we can, um, here is what we, we do with this Bloom filter based um, uh, memorization um, prevention mechanism. And what we see here is like we're measuring the blue score between like a proxy memorization basically because it perfectly prevent uh, verbatim memorization. What we see here is that uh, it does not scale with the model size anymore. Um, however, um, what when I say it kind of works co with quotation mark is that um, verbatim memorization, even though that's something that is very easy to measure, it's not really the, I guess, the main type of memorization or the only type of memorization that model does. And model does a lot of this approximate memorization. Uh, so if you measure approximate memorization rate by some arbitrary like blue score threshold, they will have much higher rate than the verbatim memorization. And here is a, I guess, fun example we found with um, uh, GitHub Copilot. Um, and they have a similar, I guess we, we didn't know what exactly they, they do with their model, but they have a similar switch you can switch on so that you do not generate, um, it will refuse to generate a completion of code if it find matches with the public code. So here is a, a very famous inverse square root uh, algorithm that available online. And we, if we just uh, do the blue line as the prompt, it will generate a few lines and then it will realize, oh, I'm copying this algorithm verbatim. I will stop here. Um, however, um, if you just add a, a pound character to it, to prefix it, and fake uh, Python, um, Python comment here, because this is a C code, it will never have this comment. So it will, it will not match any training data. And now the model is very smart. It, it realized that, okay, I, I'm going to pre prepend this pound character to every line of generation. And it also uh, kind of now um, get around this text-based matching filter because it now does not verbatim match any of the training data at all. 
and it will happily generate uh, the entire algorithm here. And this is another example. If you uh, maybe, I think it's French. If you change the variable name to French, and the model will now <laughs> generate the, the whole thing, but uh, change some of the variable names to French. And it, it, yeah, it memorized the essential information, the algorithm. And it's almost verbatim. It's like uh, maybe some of us did similar things. We change variable when we copy other people's programming solution. But uh, so I guess this uh, tells us that verbatim memorization check is is something that very easy to work with, but it's not going to work uh, in many cases. And here are some other examples, and, and they basically do this style transfer, like it do lowercase, uppercase, and uh, it uh, yeah, and change white spaces. And here are like some more language model that not code based model that also do similar things to prevent such a memorization check. It can split word into multiple tokens, or it can uh, use a different word that means the same thing, and it can do uppercase and lowercase. So, um, so because of that, I think in the last three minutes, um, I will very briefly talk about some of earlier effort we did, try to go beyond verbatim memorization. Um, I guess I'll skip that. and. I guess something um, that is probably related to um, what people in this building think about it, like there's actually um, a lot of study in psychology and cognitive science about different type of memory. There's a whole taxonomy of memory. And not all memory are bad, even when we are going to, in the context of machine learning models. And uh, in particular, uh, I want to talk about this subcategory of uh, explicit memory um, there is this difference between episodic memory and semantic memory. So uh, very roughly, uh, what uh, kind of um, um, semantic memory in code is um, like those general knowledge that you want, maybe you want your language model to know, and such as like Paris is a city in France. But episodic memory is more like a detailed information of a specific episode of event that happens, or maybe very detailed information. So. We want our model to know those common knowledge, common sense, so that it can be useful. But we don't want model to learn very specific thing about the specific user and uh, that might leak information that will not be very useful broadly. So, um, but the definition here from the uh, cognitive science perspective is is like intuitive, but it's not very approachable to compute or to measure. So. Uh, what we found is that it actually kind of matches um, the memorization we defined earlier. Like if we use the intuition that um, semantic memory is something that is repeated many, many times over and over again, and it's shared by many examples in the training set, like every, like it, this, this uh, Paris is a city in France, this knowledge is probably encoded in many examples. but private information or episodic uh, memory is probably something that not represented that, that many times. So by using the frequency, we can come up with um, something that we can compute. And it essentially goes back to the memorization score that we defined earlier. And here we, we call it counterfactual memorization, but it, it's essentially the same. So if you have a document that says, my social security number is blah, 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 uh, hopefully this document is not, or this piece of information is not contained in many documents over the internet. And in that sense, what you will see that this memorization gap or memorization score is going to be high. Because if you, uh, assuming that piece of information is private, not something common knowledge that's shared by many examples, if you remove it from the training set, this model will not be able to complete your social security number very easily. And this gap is going to be large. But for common knowledge that is encoded by, uh, in many examples, uh, this gap is going to be small. So we can essentially measure the same memorization. And hopefully, uh, I guess it approximates the notion in uh, the taxonomy of memory um, and al allows us to capture different type of memory. So here are just, uh, let's just look at the histogram on the top. It's basically 
the memorized distribution of memorization score uh, ca computed on three different data set. Uh, the, the plot is actually shown in log scale. So what we see here is that uh, most of example have low memorization. There's a dominant mode in here, but there's a tail that uh, there's a kind of tail that has high memorization examples. And here are uh, some text examples with different memorization scores. And what we found is the highest memorized example are actually not that interesting. Those are like all capital tags or some of them are foreign tags and some of them are unstructured tags. So basically those are very atypical, atypical examples in English copper. So the model basically have to memorize them because they don't follow usual English grammar. Um, but the intermediate memorized example uh, becomes slightly more interesting <clears throat> in the sense that um, they are like those are kind of news article reporting specific episode of event. And then when you go to very low memorization, you essentially see those uh, repeated tags or common informations and so on. And here, I guess, uh, just to, uh, to relate to some of earlier question is that we have a relation between memorization and number of duplicates. We know that number of duplicates is we have this scaling law that memorization in the text matching verbatim memorization sense basically scales with the number of duplicates. The more duplicate you have, the more memorization uh, you're going to have. So what we see here is that there is an anti-correlation. Uh, basically, high duplicate will lead to low memorization in this semantic memorization sense, uh, but the converse is not necessarily true. Um, and uh, another thing we can, we can measure is essentially influence. It's the same thing as the uh, image classification case where we essentially look at which training example is highly memorized and which test example does it highly influence. And we found that uh, um, also we found many like semantically almost identical articles, uh, but textually they have some like maybe either uh, explicit or implicit added that makes them, it's hard to match them textually, but yeah. Uh, one, yeah, so, uh, this this figure again shows the uh, memorization score and influence score. What we see is that in order to have high influence, the memorization has to be high. I guess uh, answering your question earlier, like can can we have a high influence when when the mode when it's actually not high memorized? Uh, I think from this figure that is almost like mostly not true. But not all highly memorized example have high influence on the test example. That also depends on the, the exact test set that you are sampling with. The larger the test set you are sampling, the more coupled pair that you are going to find. Um, yeah, so those are high influence pairs with generated examples. Um, this is the last slide uh, of this section in this talk. Um, we do have some limitation in uh, this kind of semantic um, similarity measure and semantic memorization. Uh, one thing is that it, it is computationally expensive. Um, we cannot very easily, like those large language models, uh, we still need to train at least hundreds of models in order to measure such uh, memorization. But for the currently largest model, like GPT scale model, it's not really feasible to do such retraining. So uh, one thing we've been looking at is some of those uh, retrieval based model that can we can easily do this uh, subset subset measurement without retraining and the other thing is that we don't really have a ground choose for the measurement of influence and memorization even though we, we talk about semantic memorization uh, we, we we can show examples we can show some statistics but we cannot measure the accuracy or performance of this algorithm so that's one limitation that we are uh, looking into to solve. Um, and I will skip the last section here. I'll stop here. Uh, yeah, if there's any question, I'm happy to answer. Um.